Are we making a dent down there at all, or is it a shit show? It's. <laughs> uh, I think what you see currently, it's a little bit of Vince. Man, I, I was excited to see that I had this opportunity to chat with you. A fellow brother in arms, 75th Ranger Regiment, Border Patrol. Man, so many fascinating things happening on the border in the last few years. Absolutely. I can't wait to talk about that. Give us a little bit of the origin story. Like, where are you from? What were, what were your parents like? What were some of the early kind of influences that began to shape this life that you call yours? And then we'll get yeah. into some other stuff. Um, I'm originally from uh, Los Angeles, California, a city called San Fernando. And so oh. the valley is what they call it. My parents both moved there. My mother, she was born in El Paso, a small city, El Paso, a little small little town called Canutillo, and she moved to L.A. around 18. My father moved to L.A. around 14 from the Bronx, New York. He's a Puerto Rican kid, and he got himself into some trouble early on with gang violence. And back then, it wasn't shooting-type gangs. It was more like a he had a pipe and a fight protecting his whatever, his honor. Wow. Uh, and the judge gave him an opportunity to join the Marines instead of go to jail. And so he went to the Marine Corps. And wow. so, yeah, I was raised by, you know, a really tough kind of uh, Vietnam era, but he missed the war. They, they ended before he got out of basic training. Uh, and it was a good upbringing. He was a very stern kind of individual. Mm -hmm. He kept me active in sports so that I wouldn't find myself into the gang life that, that L.A. was so famous for, if you will. Yeah. So I played sports since I was four years old. I played baseball and Really, baseball has took over my life all the way until I went to college and played ball as well. You played ball at college. Good for you. Where did yes, you go to college? First was a community college named Glendale Community College, and mm -hmm. then I went to a Kentucky college in Brescia Univer at, called Brescia University. is an mm -hmm. NAIA college for baseball. You were recruited, recruited to play baseball there? Yeah. Because Kentucky is a long way away from L.A. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all new worlds for me. I think it was. Tell us about the transition. Did you go into the Army after college right away? or I lost my full ride scholarship. I was academically ineligible. And oh. at that point, I had a daughter on the way as well. And it was, I've always wanted to be a parent. Didn't bother me being a dad, but I didn't have anything financially to support her. The only thing I can think of that would answer a lot of questions for me was joining the military. It'll give me some kind of purpose after baseball. Mm -hmm. It'll give me a paycheck so I can support my daughter. And it gives me a new mission. And so I was went to the recruiting office and I joined as an army ranger option 40 contract infantry. I didn't know you could do that. That's interesting. But I guess in the SEALs, you can get a, a contract if you qualify to go to BUD. So it makes it similar to that, huh? So you're yeah, exactly. It's called option 40. You, you have ranger in your contract. As long as you pass basic training and then you pass airborne, you go straight to RIP, and which at that time was called ranger uh, indoctrinal program. Now right. it's called ranger assessment selection program. Right. But uh, if you pass all those, yeah, you're going straight to battalion. Yeah, the training and, and what were some of the big insights or lessons Yeah, from Ranger? You know, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I was just <laughs> excited to join the military. I knew that if I made it to Ranger Battalion, it would be less time in combat and surrounded by a bunch of like hardcore chargers. By the time Ranger Regiment went overseas from four, three to four months, sometimes six months, depending, but that would be considered a long tour having my daughter in my life i wanted to try and find more time with her so i thought it would be the best decision for me plus i want to tell be... you the rest of your time is spent training off yeah. everywhere i didn't yeah, yeah. i didn't know the rest of the story <laughs> i thought i did <laughs> i thought i made the right choice and so going through the training it was always on my mind like i want to be home with my daughter and i wanted to make her proud and so my biggest push was don't quit and, you know so i can get to rain of town and also that she'll be proud of me one day and I was surprised. I was surprised that one, I took to military really well. I, I yeah. was athletically inclined to be able to run and do push-ups and sit-ups. And so like the physical aspects of it wasn't a challenge as much as mentally, like seeing how far I could get pushed. I had no mm -hmm. idea if I had the, the quit button. I I'd have never mm -hmm. been pushed hard enough in life. The hardest thing I did before the military was hell week in football. I think I surprised myself as I kept getting through the training and I kept graduating and I was like, oh, okay, maybe this is something I'm decent at. And then eventually when I graduated, like I said, the hardest part was probably the academic side of anything was written tests. And, right. and surprisingly, Ranger Regiment has a written test. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't a battalion different than the 75th is in SOCOM, but you can have, battalions are in the regular army, right? Is that? No. So I was, so 
if you have the option 40 contract, that is for Ranger Battalion. It's for and, Ranger. And there's, that's the 75th Ranger That's Regiment. the 75th. Okay. Got yeah. It. But the, what most people probably don't understand how it works is you can go there as a private and not have a Ranger tab yet. Mm-hmm. Once you get to Ranger Regiment, you actually have to earn your way to go to Ranger School. And right. that's by showing that you're mature enough, passing certain PT tests, and as well as at this time was getting a combat deployment under your belt. And so when I got there, it was just waiting my time for the long list of privates ahead of me. I had to beat them out as well as I had to get a deployment under my belt. And that would open me up for the option of going to ranger school. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. So you had to have a combat deployment in order to actually go to ranger school. So you had yeah, they some wanted skills the by them. Yes, yeah. sir. There's a lot of people at Ranger School who don't have combat experience, though, right? Because you can go Absolutely. there from the regular Army. Yeah. Yeah, That's when I really got interesting there, about. Yeah, I got in Ranger School, and I'm an I'm a PFC. I'm an E3. I had two combat deployments already, and I show up there, and I have a lot of officers who are straight out of OCS, and, yeah, I was showing them how to manage the guns, and they thought, like, what, what rank are you? Start in first class? I'm like, no, I'm a PFC. I was a nobody. I just... I'm a young dude. I just had a lot of experience. Tell us about Ranger School itself. I, I haven't talked to a Ranger in a while. I'd love to get your perspective. I had not, I, I almost went to Ranger School, but we, this is 1990. And so we ended up jockeying up to go over to Desert Storm. So that kind of bumped it. And then I never got around to it. But I had a lot of friends, just like these other guys I, I'm talking about, who went from Bud's. And then they're hanging around the team. And, and the CEO's, you slip not. You're going to Ranger School. Yes, a bunch of SEALs go to Ranger School just because. Yeah. It's good training. Another kick yeah. in the gym was good training. We don't really get that kind of LERP type nav training in the SEALs. I mean, more so not is not when I was in. Yeah, they prepare you for it for a long time. And you do a lot of like preschools to try and understand it. Really, Ranger School is about 63, 64 days. And it's three different phases. And the whole point of it is to teach leadership. It's managing your men in some of the most austere environments. They haven't slept much. They haven't ate much. And you got to get them to make good decisions on an objective. And during the time you're in ranger school, you're doing things like raids and you're doing ambushes. And it's such long days and so little food that it's easy for guys to fall asleep like mid-mission and completely ruin the whole mission. And so it's really learning how to manage people at their hardest moments and getting mm-hmm. them to be motivated for the mission. And so they just rotate leadership positions. Yeah. yeah. They just keep rotating. It's like, once you've got your go, they call it, then you, you sit back and now you're just one of the guys. And if you get a no go, then they can recycle you or they give you another option or another chance. And it's a challenge guys. They're tired. They're hungry. They haven't slept forever. And, and when it's not their day getting graded, like they could care less sometimes about how well they perform. <laughs> and so, <laughs> That's the challenge is getting these guys motivated for you when, when you need them to. And it's one of the best leadership schools I've ever been to. And, and I've learned a lot about myself and, and how much I can endure, um, mm-hmm. but as well as how to manage people in, in those kind of environments. And so it was a blessing. It was a really fun school. I enjoyed it. Yeah, that's cool. Is there a lot of attrition? Oh, absolutely. There is. It's one of those schools just like a, almost like a selection. Right. You start with, I think you start with, classes started like big as 200 people and then by the end of it maybe graduating a group of 60 yeah 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 that sounds cool i wouldn't really want to do it now in my life but i wish i had gotten that chance way back when <laughs> would have been good yeah. for my net my land nav skills which were definitely a little bit lacking I used, my, my my enlisted guys used to laugh they're like sir you're gonna stick to leadership and you're gonna leave the land nav to us they're like check yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you have gps which changes everything. that's right yeah, that's right. It's a game changer. So tell us about your combat experience and what was that like? Where'd you serve yeah. and highs and lows there? Yeah, I, I did my first tours in Afghanistan and it was a pretty, pretty mild deployment. I was, it was really learning as much as I possibly can being the new guy. You, know, you don't hear time. that very often, by the way. Yeah, I was in Afghanistan as a ranger and it was pretty mild. Yeah. Most people won't, won't believe you. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. It's, it was mild compared to like my next deployment to Mosul. Yeah, in 2005, right, which was like one of the triangles of death, right? One of the apexes right. of death. Comparably, it was a good deployment to understand what was going on. It was, I got into Ranger Battalion and I was deployed within 45 days. And it was a lot to take in as a new soldier in the military, just to be with under a year, you're already overseas. And so there was a lot of learning that had to happen. We had some really good missions. I learned a lot and 
I was ready to see what was next. Uh, after that deployment, I had an option to go to Ranger School, but I already, I already heard that we had Iraq next. Uh, and part of me was part of the platoon. I didn't want to see them go without me. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to experience Iraq as well. And so I opted to just go to the deployment instead of Ranger School. And uh, that was Mosul. And Mosul was one of the hottest areas at the time. It was sec two. Fallujah was a big one. Then now Mosul was. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of action happening. We walked away with a lot of Purple Hearts and right. very successful, very successful deployment. Uh, a lot of engagements. This is what you expect. What was you the know? primary mission for you? It was uh, to Just kill hunt, a capture. Hunt and capture? Yeah. Yeah, kill a capture. And we were doing TST missions, so time sets of target missions mm -hmm. most of the time. And then the days off, we were QRF for mm -hmm. guys like Delta and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so we were actively doing missions. And the way the missions were was really cool that you would think you'd do one mission in a day and it's done. No, we were doing six missions, six different targets. We, Same with you know, the teams. We'd in, yeah. Yep. We'd bag them up, come in and start gathering more intel. And boom, do another one. And it just would... It was all night and we did a lot of damage in the four months we were there and it was a very successful deployment for us and at some point i was very concerned about man we keep getting hit it's a numbers game when is it going to be my time but blessed to get out of that did one did you and, lose yeah. anyone in your unit in that deployment no we That's just took amazing yeah we were very blessed yeah we the vehicle yeah. in front of me blew up we, we they hit an id and i could have sworn when we Popped the hatch of that striker. I thought, man, what's going to be in here? And everyone was balled up and paint in pain, but they all survived. And was like, man, it was a blessing. And wow. then two guys, they took a hand grenade. One guy got one of our platoons. They took a hand grenade, and three or four of them got hit with that grenade. But again, everyone survived. And so we had these instances that we were just like a lot of close calls, and very fortunate that we didn't have anything worse than that. That's and amazing. Then, yeah. And so in between that time, I went to Ranger School. When I graduated Ranger School, I had an injury. My brachial plexus nerve damage in my shoulder, so this right arm was dead at the time. And we weren't sure if it was ever going to get feeling back because the way nerves grow. And so I missed the next deployment. And in that deployment, we lost a few of our men. And that mm -hmm. was a tough one. It was a tough one to know that I missed it. Those are some guys I looked up to. They were some of the best leaders of my career. And unfortunately, I wasn't there to hopefully assist and be a part of that but I was a part of taking them to their final resting place. And so that was an honor. That's good. As, yeah. as much as that was hard, it was, I felt uh, I at least got that kind of closure for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost a guy in training. One of my best friends, he was killed in a live fire training accident. That just unfortunately happens when you train like that sometimes. Shouldn't, mm -hmm. but things happen. And then my last tour was in Afghanistan again. And uh, op tempo was big, but it, the, the weird thing about Afghanistan to Iraq for me was... Afghanistan was dry hole, dry hole, dry hole, boom, action. And it was different in Mosul. It was like always action, action, action. And yeah. so I felt that Afghanistan, I was very thoughtful about not being complacent because so many dry holes you would hit yeah. or so yeah. many objectives that would be nothing. And, and you can get very complacent at those times. And, and I knew it was my last deployment. So I'm like, don't yeah. get complacent. Don't man. fuck like, up. Stay, yes, in a fight, man. Iraq was urban fighting and Afghanistan was more rural, right? And yeah. so you had yeah. longer Absolutely. distances to travel and like a single home versus. Yeah, it wasn't uncommon to, to, yeah, it wasn't yeah. uncommon to get dropped off by a helicopter and walk in seven clicks. That was typical mission for us in Afghanistan. Fascinating. Yeah. So you decided, was it, I mean, your injury obviously. Yeah, it healed, healed. Up for that. Yep. Right. Yeah, okay. it healed. And after losing those two men, and really learning a lot about myself. So you knew I you were done after that deployment, before you yeah, went into it. Yeah, I thought it was time to go try something different. Got it. Okay. Thank you for your service. That's huge, by the way. Thank you. All the listeners do as well. Any issues with post-medic stress or you or some of your teammates? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think about any of that because I was so busy trying to get another job. And I had kids and I was so busy. Uh, I did feel, uh, I, I felt bad for leaving my, my friends. And I know they had... Sergeant Petrie, he, he received the Medal of Honor uh, shortly after I left in the next deployment. Uh, and he, what he was doing was also with another private of mine that I worked with. And so, like, it was all connected. And I, I started to feel really guilty for leaving the team. But more so, I was so busy and I was drinking so often that I didn't really acknowledge it until later on. Mm -hmm. When I finally became a Border Patrol agent, I knew, okay, cool, I found the career I wanted. And so, as I started settling into that, Mm -hmm. that's when I started to notice all the after effects because life slowed down all of a sudden. Right. I wasn't chasing. I wasn't in this panic. And I started to realize these little things that would pop up would be certain smells that would remind me of Afghanistan or Iraq. And 
and certain things, uh, night terrors were starting to happen more often. And, and I couldn't, I didn't understand. I was like, man, I didn't feel like I had any problems for two, three years. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden I, I'm, I'm sober currently. I, yeah. I'm sober four and a half years now. Right. And that is because I needed to manage that side of my life. I was using drinking to cope and heal and try and safeguard myself from having bad dreams and memories. And so in the past 10 years, I've taken a, a big leap into the wellness and, and mindfulness and Good done a you. lot of therapies to to heal that side of me. Yeah. That's partly why I took to writing as a therapeutic value and took to acting as therapeutic value. And that's why my career is where it is now. As it takes a lot of self-awareness to be a writer and an actor. Emotional development is part and parcel if you want to be good at it. Yes. I could see what you're saying there. For my generation, there was virtually nothing except for a broken VA. But it's nice to see the support that's now available for our brothers and sisters. There's all sorts of organizations now, mostly nonprofit, but even the VA started to get their act together, right? And all these modalities, like you said, you can go to yoga retreats, you can do meditation, you can do psychedelic therapies, EMDR. I've tried a Moloch's Valuable Foundation to help vets called the Courage Foundation. And so I wanted to, I don't like to promote anything that I don't have direct experience with. So (laughs) I'm the same same as you. I've been across the board and that stuff. It works, you know, know, maybe everyone has to find their own path. Absolutely. Yeah. I've done the same thing. I consider myself a little bit of a guinea pig in in attempting and trying many different modalities. Mm. Yeah. Well, special ops guys are not afraid to be guinea pigs. Yeah. (laughs) because <laughs> we were for years. I lived down on the border almost. I Actually, Coronado was practically right on the border. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we used to go across the Tijuana all the time, but not so much anymore. It's a little bit sketchy down there. Yeah. But most of the border, so you were in the Border Patrol. Did you just serve in Texas or Arizona or San Diego? Yeah, Where, whereabouts was, were you? Yeah, I was in, in Texas. My first duty station was in the Del Rio sector, which is Del Rio, El pa- Eagle Pass, and Comstock. It's just like a long list of them, but Del Rio sector is where I was at first. And then eventually I transferred to SOG, the special operations group yeah. out of El Paso, Texas. Got it. So d- tell us what that's like. What was it like being a, an agent in the border patrol? What's really going on besides what you read in the paper, or you hear yeah. political blabbers talking about? Yeah. Look, the border patrol to me is probably the most patriotic law enforcement that we have in America, those men and women have have chosen to defend our nation and they are the first line defense against any kind of terrorist act. And so genuinely the career field is such a valuable career that we, that we need in the, in America. The problem is, and, and why I even wrote the book was I was very tired of everyone giving their opinion on a subject that they had no information or no lack of knowledge of when the world and the news addresses border patrol as border control, or they identify the blue uniforms as border patrol agents, which is false, or they don't know the difference between customs, border patrol, and ICE, right? right? Then they're doing a disservice to the agency because they're making assumptions. And those assumptions have been detrimental to the morale of the border patrol. That daily where people blame the border patrol for everything. Like they're the reasons why this, or they're not doing their job. And just like the sheriff's department doesn't determine the speed limit, the border patrol doesn't determine the policy. Right. And so my goal in writing this book was to explain how policies are, are created, but as well as what the job day in and day out of a border patrol agent is. And, and for those who are listening, the job for a border patrol agent is to apprehend and process genuinely. Mm-hmm. So they stand in positions that are high vis for deterrence, or they go cut sign, or they look for tracks of people who have entered illegally in America outside of a port of entry. And so the goal was to explain the day in and day out job. Their job is to try and stop and slow down illegal entry into America. And once they do apprehend individuals, their, their job is to bring them in and process them under whatever policy is in place at that moment. It could be an executive order that changed the policies when we had Title 42 recently. It could be anything. So whatever it is in that sector, whatever the process is, that's what they do. If the individuals themselves say, I'm here because of political asylum from my country, right? Okay, the Board of Choice is not the person who makes that determination. Yeah. The Board of Choice just processes the paperwork, hands it off to ICE, and ICE manages what happens next. Eventually, those people will wait for an opportunity to see the immigration judge for the immigration judge to make a determination of the case. But that's not a border patrol agent's job. And so mm-hmm. 
in the end of the day, my job was to, and for writing this book, I, I felt like I wanted to continue to serve my country. And as someone who was a former Border Patrol agent, who's seen it and who understands the career field, I felt that if I could put into words in a way that's digestible, other people will start to really understand the foundation of what the Border Patrol does. And I think that will help enlighten the rest of the questions they have for how immigration is and why it is what it is today. Yeah. First off, are there a lot of Hispanics in the Border Patrol? It yeah, would make absolutely. sense to me, right? Yeah. It must be confusing for some of the, like, dang it, you know? Yeah. Ha, you should just let me go, buddy. You got to yeah, yeah. you, you definitely get a lot of, what's going on? We're the same, but it's not. I think it's over 60, 70% of the Border Patrol is Hispanic of some sort. No kidding. And understanding why that is, I think people think that's a conflict of interest, and it's not. Like, we're Americans. We're American citizens. And we want to continue to uphold uh, the values of what America is. And yep. that means that there's rules. And in those rules means you have to enter into the country legally. And it is a very good job and it pays very well compared to most law enforcement officer jobs. And so I have empathy for anyone who wants to come in and live in America because America is this great nation and they want opportunity. But that empathy only goes so far as for me to still do my job because I don't know who anyone is who's coming across the border who has bad intentions. Yeah. And so the only answer for us is to stop everyone. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, there's the issue of drugs and fentanyl is such a big deal that's coming across the border. But also people are worried about jihadis and terrorists. Did you see any of that? Tell us about some of your experiences. Yeah, I still do a lot of consulting for the Border Patrol right now. And I go down to the border and I do observations and I work with a lot of the local law enforcement as well. And the concept of that, they call that exotics, right? So you have Mexicans who are from Mexico, you have other than Mexicans, is anyone from south of the border? So very common Hondurans or Guatemalans, those are very common countries that come across and to cross illegally. But the ones who are not very common, we call them exotics. And those exotics are, are, are like Afghanistan, right? Or, or, or African or you know, Chinese. And hmm. anytime you have an exotic, you really have to be concerned about the distance they travel just to come through illegally. And that is a concern. That is someone who has money for one. And what is their, what's their objective? Is it really just to come to America for the land of opportunity? Or is it more? Someone like me who has a tactical background, I, I see there's a duality in this where people come across all the time because they want a better opportunity. Obviously, they have to go through the process that the policies are in place. But why? Why are some of these exotic countries coming in more so now than ever? The tactical side of my brain gets very concerned about what that looks like five years from now. Yeah. Exactly. And so I don't fear monger this subject because I think enough people already do. Mm. But I do sit in a position who have seen the worst of things overseas. And I do get concerned about the numbers of exotic countries that are coming across illegally through the southern border. Yeah. What percentage are actually apprehended of all illegals? It's a great question. Um, I'll say just the other day, we'll just do it this way. In the Del Rio sector, I believe they apprehended over 8,000 uh, illegal for, for the month, 8,000. And it's a, that's a massive influx. That's not that's normal. That's huge. That's numbers wow. massive. Right. It's not. And that's just one sector, one area. Oh, one sector, exactly. And that's pretty extreme, but that's the number. And then what they have listed for gotaways is what we call it. I believe it was in the thousands. And a gotaway, how do you determine that? That's because I've been able to track the footprints all the way to maybe a road and determine that those footprints don't cross the road. So it's only obvious they've been picked up at that road. And that's only the ones that they're counting. When you say the border is secure, or my orca said the border is secure, what his definition and what our definition might be is slightly different. Slightly right. different. <laughs> right. And as much as, yes, you have border agents on the line, yes, you have everyone's doing their job, that doesn't mean that just because you catch 20 here, 100 didn't get away this way mm -hmm. or that way, right? And it's very hard to say. I would say, I would say there's probably a good, and, I, and I'm going to be very vague here with 20%, probably get by with no one ever noticing. Yeah, that, that's probably, probably on the low side. <laughs> yeah. I'm just winging it. What, do you think the wall did and will help at all? They're starting to yeah, you know, the, the, there's always been a wall. Like yeah. the misconception of build the wall, turn into a, kind of a, 
political argument left and right using it for their narratives or agendas but there's always been a wall there's always been I've a fence. seen one on the california side i didn't know how far yeah. it extended yeah yeah and it extends all the way there's different pockets of it i believe having a wall is very valuable because it funnels traffic in areas where now agents can have easier yeah. op options the border's vast and there's areas that are so hard to manage i'm talking two three hours from anywhere right those are the areas that deserve something that slows down traffic. And yeah. so the wall is valuable in that sense. And no matter what, people will find a way to get over it, under it, through it. And yeah. that's fine. It just still slows down the traffic so we can do our best to get to it and apprehend who we can. Yeah. Hamas uses a, a latticework of tunnels to get under Gaza, Israeli positions and stuff. And I've heard there's tunnels under the wall in certain areas. Is Absolutely. that a big issue? Like if you... Absolutely. In certain areas is more than others. San Diego is infamous for having tunnels all under San Diego and oh, you catch them as, as often as you can. But yeah, there, I was just in El Centro and there's a tunnel they just caught recently that went from the wall about a mile in and goes into a house. And there was a house that it would just they would exit the house. And so it looks like just people coming in and out of the house. And no, they're using the tunnel. And oh, so okay. very common. This is a co very common practice. And San Diego is very well known for having tons of tunnels all over the place. Hmm. That's pretty amazing. So what, like, what was the scariest thing that you had to deal with as an agent? When managing any kind of... Besides the bureaucracy. <laughs> right, right. When managing any kind of drug smuggling cases, those are all of, of a concern. I've done several busts of marijuana and at the time, it was marijuana was a big deal. Now it's so, so different. But uh, a big bust, 8,000, 12,000 pounds of, of dope. You're always concerned if the smuggler is carrying weapons. And during mm -hmm. my time, we lost an agent named Brian Terry to, to uh, a rip crews who were stealing the dope from drug traffickers. And you always have a concern when someone's carrying drugs that they're carrying a, a rifle. And so those mm -hmm. are probably the most serious interactions you have. I fortunately haven't had that where every time I've interdicted with it, they've been able to scatter and they drop it and they've run back. And so there's moments where you, you feel it's close. You feel like you might have engagement and then boom, it scatters and, and it goes away. There was a couple of times I've had failure to yields and those are high speed chases. Yeah. And as much as those might be fun, those are also very intimidating because who knows that, what ends up there. And so right. I did, I had a failure to yield in the book. I talked about that the vehicle was known for uh, smuggling firearms. And so when you get that call over the radio and say, a vehicle known for smuggling firearms, you already know that, okay, they have firearms. And so you're kidding up even better. You're double checking, making sure you're, you're locking and loading. And you're like, here we go. And in that scenario, they ended up getting away from us because when you go through a school zone, our rules are we have to slow down. And eventually we found the vehicle. And when we found the vehicle, it was completely emptied. So whatever they had with them, they got away with it. Now, yeah. Is human trafficking an issue? at the southern border yeah absolutely absolutely Not that's I, I think it's more than an issue i think that's one of the biggest issues you have currently right now when you think of why uh, because drugs has changed the, the landscape of drugs because marijuana has been legalized in several states i think that's changed and so what is a the most valuable commodity currently is humans and mm. smuggling humans and trafficking humans is, is fairly easy compared to what you might think. That's why when you saw the images years ago about separating kids from their parents, a big part of what we have to do is we have to investigate the scenario and if that is their parent in the first place. Mm -hmm. Part of that means you separate adults from children and you start to do the investigation. Mm -hmm. People don't understand that like, you can't separate. The, well, most of those aren't even their families. Those That's are right. like someone's paid them to transport them and who knows what happens and half those females of age from nine to a, to even older uh, they have to take birth control so they don't get pregnant on the way it's not if it's when they get raped and so wow. very dangerous and unsettling concept but that is the most uh prized commodity currently right now is human trafficking are we making a dent down there at all or is it a shit show it's, <laughs> uh, I think what you see currently, it's a little bit of a shit show. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is due to the fact of we don't have anything in place for the massive influx of immigration that's happening currently. There's mm -hmm. nothing that we can do when you have a thousand people, 10,000 people come across a border. Who's supposed to house them? Who's supposed to feed them? Who, where are they supposed to go? We, we're so backed up in our immigration 
process when it comes to seeing an immigration judge that they're getting notice to appear. It's an NTA and saying, go to your, go to a sponsor's house here in America and come back in six months, 10 years, whatever it is, right? I've heard there's some up to 10 years right now. I'm not, I haven't confirmed that. But then what? Those people are in America now doing whatever they want for the next however many years until they have an immigration date to determine whether their case is valid or not. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing currently in place that can help fix this. They're doing the best they can. Border Patrol agents are genuinely doing the best they can. Uh, and the immigration process is doing the best they can. But we're only doing what the policies allow us to do and what the policy, policies tell us to do. Yeah. And so in the event that people aren't happy with the current situation, it comes down to who you vote, how you vote. Right. And really understanding what policies you're voting for. Yeah. As an insider and on a consultant, what do you see the gap in policy besides inaction? Inaction yeah. is inexcusable. And we've seen a lot of that. But if all of a sudden everyone, whoever's in the current White House or even the future one, was like, okay, Vince, tell me how to fix this. What would you say? Yeah. And, and that's a hard one because there's not a one plus one equals two answer. There's no aha answer besides a multiple layered echelon approach to this. I'm right. talking, we need to one, have some kind of education going down south and explaining how immigration works legally and explaining the, it's the counter psychological operations to cartel saying, right. they tell you this, here's the truth. Yeah, they need the leaflets that say, hey, if you come into the border, it's not going to go out. It's not going right. to go the way you want exactly. it to. When, when I know how this works, but we need that. We need right. some counter right. intel that's going to be explaining the truth. We need to see why these individuals are leaving the how us, how we can have some kind of help and assistance in helping those countries flourish so then we don't have this constant issue. We also needed like to, to not incentivize coming over illegally. We've yeah. incentivized that. And so yeah. now you have, you're telling me I, I can just go and they're going to they're gonna give me food. They're going to give me money. They're going to give me a plane ticket. And so when you incentivize this, what do you think is going to happen? They're just going to call their friends and say, dude, come now. And so there's a lot of things. And I think there needs to be a, a stronger repercussion on those who enter illegally. If you've broken the law, I believe there should be some kind of jail time. Even the, those who are claiming asylum have to be held accountable for breaking the law still, right? And I know you're claiming asylum, but there's a process for that. And anytime you're entering into America outside of the port of entry, you're breaking the law. Right. And so there's a long list of things that need to happen. It's a seven layer cake of decisions that need to be made. I think when we stop incentivizing illegal immigration, you'll start to see a dent in that already. And yeah. that's a big one. Yeah. Politically, there doesn't seem to be any appetite for that, unfortunately. But. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, I think it's frustrating for a lot of people. I try not to, like I said, I don't get too, I try not to get too angry on the subject because this is my subject matter expert position. I know a lot of morale in the Border Patrol is low at the moment because it feels sometimes that they're handcuffed and not able to do their own job. Was there any other key takeaway from Borderline, the book, that you'd like to share? Yeah, to the book it's, yeah, absolutely. The book itself was written to, for multiple reasons. I know the morale of the Border Patrol is a little low right now. And for them to see that, that they have a voice on the outside that supports them, that believes in them, is what the goal of the book is. It also is to hopefully be a big recruiting tool for the Border Patrol. For those who don't understand the career field, don't know the levels of special operations you can do, things you can do in the Border Patrol that are just second to the military, why wouldn't you try the Border Patrol? So it's a recruiting tool for the Border Patrol as well. And it's, those, it's a tool for those who really want to know more but just don't. I've written it in a way that has digestible information. It goes down the path of my experience as a Border Patrol agent. It talks about all these little parts that most people wouldn't understand. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it really explains the duality of homeland security and immigration policy and how we as a country want to have both of those to be successful for us mm -hmm. as a country that is built on immigration, but we also have to be a country that protects our safety and our freedoms. And so it really breaks that down and explains it in, in a way that I think anyone can read this and enjoy and understand. And it really is my goal to tell the Border Patrol man that I love and respect what they do daily, and it is not unnoticed. That's awesome. Yeah, it's important work. Um, do you have a, like a, a special website you like people to go to learn about the book, or do you just send them to Amazon or wherever? Yeah, you can go to Amazon. You can go to anywhere books are sold. I did the audio book myself with my voice. Sweet. Jaco wow. did the forward. He did oh, the forward as well. We're, we're really pushing. It is the first imprint of the Jocko Press publishing. And so nice. we're excited. Oh, cool. Yeah we're, yeah, we're very excited to see where this goes. Yeah, you can find it anywhere books are sold. Right on.
And um, I have to ask about your acting. How'd you get into that? And what are you currently working on? <laughs> I got into it just by chance. I, I produced a movie myself, me and some friends. I got, I, I really saw what it was like. I enjoyed it. I started doing acting as therapy mm -hmm. and I got an opportunity to do an audition for a major show and I landed it. So mm -hmm. I was on that show for the past five years. It's called Mayans MC. You can see it on Hulu. It is the spinoff of Sons of Anarchy. My character was able to go from the first take all the way to the last pretty much. And no so kidding. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. And I became a writer on that show for the last season as well. And it was a, it was a, an amazing five years of my life. And now that's done. We are pitching several new television shows and we're waiting to hear back and seeing which ones we can continue on. Awesome. Good luck with that. It's killer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Vince, thanks so much again for your service, both the Border Patrol and the, and the Army and for writing this book. It's important. Your brothers down there and sisters, they deserve to have better support. Yes, sir. Right? And to have their Absolutely. spirits lifted. So good job there. Uh, what about social media? Where can folks reach out and connect with yeah. you? You can find me in just Vincent Rocco Vargas, R-O-C-C-O, -C -C Vincent Rocco Vargas on Instagram, Facebook, you name it. I'm there. Right on, brother. All right. Awesome. Well, who ya? Thanks for Thanks. showing up on the Mark Devine Show. I really appreciate you, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah.